Let's bow our heads in prayer before we begin this morning. Lord, as we consider your glory and your majesty, as we consider the grace of the gospel, what Christ has done for us on the cross, Lord, we are moved to worship this morning and to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to you. Lord, forgive us for often having small thoughts of you, for our forgetfulness of the grace of your gospel. We pray that today you would speak to us through your word and and reinvigorate our faith, give us a clear vision of you, give us a clear understanding of your will so that we might walk in obedience and faith for your glory. Lord, your law is perfect and it revives our soul. Your testimonies are sure and they make us wise when we are simple. Lord, your precepts are right, and they cause our hearts to rejoice. Your commandment is pure and enlightens our eyes. The fear of you is clean and endures forever. Father, your rules are true and righteous altogether, and they are more to be desired than gold, even fine gold. They're sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. And Lord, we know that through your word you warn us as your servants, and that in keeping your word there is great reward. Lord, this is true. It's what you say about your own word. And so we ask that as we come to your word this morning, that you would speak to us, revive our hearts, grant us wisdom, give us joy, and instruct us in the way we should live. We pray this in the name of our Savior Jesus, the one who shed his blood for us. Amen. All right, we'll go ahead and dismiss the children for Children's Church. You guys can head downstairs. I'd like to invite you all to turn this morning to the book of James. If you're visiting with us today and you don't have a Bible, you don't have a copy of the scriptures, we'd love to give you one. We've got a couple. You can raise your hand real quick, and Dominic can grab that and slip that into your hands. But please turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. How many of you are familiar with the name George Steinbrenner? Does that ring a bell for anybody? About two or three baseball fans in the room know who I'm talking about. George Steinbrenner was born in July of 1930. It's a couple years before several of us were born. And he died in July 2010 at the age of 80 years old. And in between those two events, George Steinbrenner owned the New York Yankees, that baseball organization. And they won, during his time of ownership, seven World Series titles and 11 American League pennants. And a year before George Steinbrenner died, it was estimated that his net worth was $1.15 billion, billion with a B. But all it took was a heart attack in 2010 to forever separate George Steinbrenner from his powerful position, his wealth, his fame, his championship rings, his national pennants, everything else that he spent his whole career building. It was gone. And the story of George Steinbrenner is not a new story. I mean, this is an episode that's literally been on repeat since Adam and Eve sinned and death entered into the world. The truth is that life is short and then you die. And death comes for both the rich and the famous, and it also comes for the poor, the unknown, the overlooked, and the lowly. For every George Steinbrenner, there are countless multitudes of unknowns, people whose names we will never hear, people whose accomplishments were never noticed. People who lived hard lives and enjoyed very little earthly blessing, and then they died. Now, this would be a terribly depressing reality, wouldn't it, if it were not for the grace of God. The fact that because of Jesus, there is more to life than simply what you can get here. It's his grace that gives meaning and hope and strength to help us endure this short life, which oftentimes doesn't feel so short. It's the promise of future grace, the promise of eternal life with Christ, the promise of an eternal reward for all who belong to him. That's what encourages us to persevere when life is hard and helps us to rightly value what really matters. Our text this morning is James chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. James writes, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. And the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. 
Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. In our study through the book of James, we've tried to bring out each week that genuine faith affects all of life. That's James' thesis in this letter. And in chapter 1, James has been showing us that faith should affect how we respond to trials. By faith, we can count it all joy when we face trials of various kinds. In faith, we seek wisdom from God when we find ourselves lacking wisdom. And James tells us now that faith will also produce in us joyful perseverance. That's the central idea of our text, that faith in future grace produces joyful perseverance. James gives us perspective here. Whether you, whether you lack or whether you face loss, James gives us perspective to look to the future, to look to the finish line, and to evaluate life and to evaluate what really matters in light of that day. And if we do, it produces joyful perseverance. You know, Scripture often tells us to not forget the grace of God, what's been done for us in the past already. We look back, don't we, to what Jesus has done. We consider his, his birth and his righteous life, his substitutionary death on the cross, his glorious resurrection, and we rejoice in everything that God accomplished on our behalf through the work of Jesus Christ. That is grace. We celebrate that in song. We speak of it uh, to one another. We celebrate it in communion. We sing of the forgiveness that we have received. We give testimony to one another in sharing about what God has done for us in his past provision, in his past guidance, in the comfort that we have experienced in God. Looking back at God's grace in the past produces a lot of gratitude, doesn't it? Much gratitude. But James reminds us of a coming experience of grace, of future grace. And looking to this future grace gives us hope. We believe by faith that God will bring us safely home, that he will raise us to new life, and that he will receive us into the eternal rest and bestow upon us eternal joy. And this is grace, is it not? This is a gift And it is a gift that is coming in the future. So if past grace sort of pushes us forward, future grace pulls us along. And we need both. We need both. We need to see God's grace in the past, but we also must look to God's grace in the future. We need to see his faithfulness and then reach forward believing that God will be faithful in the future. Faith in this future grace will produce in us joyful perseverance. That's James's point. And I want to share with you this morning two ways in which the reality of this future grace invites faith and encourages joyful perseverance. Number one, in verses 9 through 11, we see that future grace offers joy despite our circumstances. He says in verse 9, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. James addresses two very different types of people here, both who are experiencing different kinds of circumstances. And interestingly, he tells them that their perceived earthly status, whether they are lowly or whether they are rich, is ultimately insignificant. First, he addresses the lowly brother in verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast, he says in his exaltation. Now, most believers during this time period were poor. Just to remind you of who he's writing to, jump back up to verse 1. He's writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. These are people who have been driven from their homes. They're living in foreign lands without the support of of generational family and wealth and friends and connections and business partnerships. And and these people were, were outcasts because of that. Identifying with Christ in James's day was the fast track to economic difficulty in that society. So many of them would have been lowly in a financial sense. Um, But they were also lowly when it came to their social status. I think this is broader than just money. 
These people were outcasts. They were part of the dispersion. They were hated for their faith, often rejected by society. Their fellow Jews hated them because they believed Jesus was the Messiah. It's not a great way to win friends and influence people if you're living in Jerusalem in the first century. So their fellow Jews hated them, but their foreign neighbors also hated them because of racial tensions, because of national pride, and because these Jewish Christians were non-conformers. They didn't conform to pagan culture and pagan worship, and so everyone looked at them strangely, and they were not well-received in the various cultures that they landed in as they fled the persecution in Jerusalem. So they were lowly financially, socially. They had it hard. And James tells this lowly brother to boast or to rejoice and to be glad in their exaltation. And you go, what are you talking about, James? I don't see any exaltation going on here. Isn't exaltation a total contradiction with being lowly? You're saying we're lowly and we're exalted. Which is it? How can both of these things be true? How can someone who is suffering great financial lack and someone who's an outcast socially be considered exalted? How does that work? I want you to turn the page and look at James chapter 2, verse 5. I think you can get a, a little bit of an insight into where James is coming from here. James chapter 2, verse 5, James says, Listen, my beloved brothers. Listen, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? You see, from James's perspective, he sees that these brothers, though they are lowly by the world standards, are truly exalted when you look through the lens of faith. He refers to them as brothers. They have a relationship with God that brings with it a status that all the adversity in the world can't compare to. He says they are loved by God. They are beloved. He says that they are chosen by God, the recipients of his sovereign grace. He says that they are rich in faith, something that cannot be eaten by moths, something that cannot rust. And he says that they are heirs of the kingdom and recipients of the promise of God. Here's his point. Friends, we can rejoice because we will gain everything. This kingdom that is coming, the reward that is coming, makes all of our lack in this world totally insignificant. Paul says in Romans 8, doesn't he? that the sufferings of this present world aren't even worth comparing with the glories that will be revealed. He says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. We may be poor in the world's terms, but we are truly exalted if we know Christ. Their spiritual blessing has far greater value than anything in this world because the eternal reward that they will receive, this kingdom that they are going to inherit, this status as chosen and beloved by God, this is something that cannot be lost. And he reminds them it's something that cannot be, cannot be achieved for themselves. It's the gift of God. This is grace. To be a brother is to be chosen by God. What an exalted status to be adopted into his family. What a great privilege to be heirs of the kingdom. Unlike all the stuff in this world, money, fame, reputation, things that can be lost, our inheritance with Christ, what they are destined to receive, that lasts forever. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, 3-6, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, get this, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. Peter's preaching the same sermon. He's saying we look to what is to come, and it lasts, and it matters, and it is valuable, and it cannot be lost. And so we can rejoice right now, even though we're facing adversity, even though we experience trials, even though we may be, from the world's perspective, considered lowly. So James says to the lowly brother, rejoice, brother. Don't look at your earthly status. 
Look at your spiritual position. And he's calling us to evaluate our standing, not from, not from the world's vantage point, but to look at things from God's angle and to consider that we are truly exalted. Earthly fortune is not always a sign of God's blessing. And poverty or difficulty is not always a sign of his displeasure. I'm going to say that again because in our day and age, some people preach the opposite. But listen to this. It's clearly taught in Scripture. You read Job, you read James, you read Paul, you read Jesus, and we learn that earthly fortune is not always a sign of God's blessing, nor is poverty or difficulty always a sign of his displeasure. This is something we need to embrace and believe by faith. Physical poverty pales in comparison to our eternal reward. And earthly rejection... The earthly opposition from people, the loss of earthly status or reputation, it doesn't mean anything when you know that you have the approval of God himself. That what he said to his son Jesus, you are my beloved son and in you I am well pleased. When you know that that word of approval has been granted to you because of the imputed righteousness of Christ, then who cares what someone else says about me? Because God has accepted me in Christ. When these realities sink in, when we have faith in future grace, what is to come, then the sorrow and the discontentment and the disappointment and the frustration of being lowly in this world gives way to rejoicing. Rejoice, glory, boast in your exaltation. The poor and lowly child of God can rejoice because he will gain everything. Paul says to live is Christ and to die, to die is gain. It's gain. That's why we can rejoice even if you are a lowly brother or sister today. But we can also, secondly, rejoice even though we're going to lose everything. So we can rejoice because we're going to gain everything, but we can also rejoice even though We're going to lose everything. Look in verses 10 and 11. He gives this illustration that the rich man, the one who seems to have it all in this world, is just like the flower of the grass. It withers. It's temporary. James points just like like his half-brother Jesus to, to the nature and the landscape around him and says, that's what we're like. Everything we have here in this world is temporary and fragile and brittle, and it passes away. And James tells those who are rich to boast in their humiliation. Wealth does not last. Those pursuing wealth die in the middle of unfinished efforts to accomplish unachieved goals. And earthly wealth is simply temporary. Psalm 49, verse 16 through 17 says, Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. Paul puts it this way in 1 Timothy 6, 7. We brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of the world. Our modern prophets have put it, there's no U-Hauls behind hearses. Like, it doesn't work that way. You can't take it with you. So, who are these rich that James is talking about? While many were poor in that day, there were some who were rich. But let's talk about today. Who among us would qualify as the rich? That's probably all of us. Most all of us in this room would fall into this category of having a lot of personal possessions, having some financial ability. Most of us would fall into this category. So what does this mean for us? How do we rejoice in our humiliation? I think James is telling us to embrace and even celebrate the fact that we're going to lose everything in earthly terms. And what that means is we should be able to laugh at ourselves and be completely at peace with the fact that we can't take it with us when we die. That shouldn't cause us any heartburn. That shouldn't cause us to grieve. We should be able to smile and nod and say, that's right, can't take any of this stuff with me. To rejoice in our humiliation means we aren't too tied to our riches. It means that we aren't too invested in our business agendas. That we aren't trusting too much in our retirement plans. That we know it's all going to evaporate soon. So we can hold it loosely. We can give it freely. 
We can resist the urge to trust in our wealth and our possessions and our earthly means. It means that you don't mourn the scratch or the dent in your car. And it means that you can shake your head and smile when your water heater goes out. We're not surprised and we're not crushed when these things happen. Boasting in our humiliation means that we're not actually looking at our wealth. We're looking past it. We're looking past it. We're looking to eternity. We're looking by faith to future grace and say, I'm going to lose all of this and I don't care. You know why? Because I am an heir of the eternal kingdom of Christ. And that is what matters for eternity. And that's why we can boast. We boast not in what we have. We boast in who we know. As a child of the king, as an heir of the kingdom, as one who knows God, this has no hold on me. And it will not last. I love Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. You want to boast in something? You want to be confident in something? You want to rejoice in something? It has nothing to do with what you have in this world, with your wisdom, with your might, with your wealth. If you know God, you have it all, and that's what matters. If all you have are things that possess earthly value, a reputation, resources, financial independence, possessions, if that's all you have, then all you have to look forward to is loss and futility and tragedy. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. You get this dose of reality that says, why pile up all this stuff when you're just going to die and it's going to go to somebody else who didn't work for it and your kids will probably waste it? That's Ecclesiastes. If all you have is earthly things, then all you can look forward to is loss. But if all you have is Christ, then you can look forward to the fullness of eternal life. And this encouragement should protect those among us who might be lowly, those who might be poor, whether financially or socially, that should protect us from trying to pursue wealth and pursue earthly status. And it should protect those who are rich from being tempted to trust in those things. We can rejoice because we have everything to gain. And James tells us we can rejoice even though we're going to lose everything that we work for here on this earth. Future grace, the reality of future grace, offers us joy Real joy, lasting joy, despite our circumstances. But there's a second point here that James gives us in verse 12. And that's that future grace motivates perseverance through our circumstances. So if we have faith in this future grace, what it is that God has promised when we reach the finish line, that gives us joy, even in the middle of our circumstances. But it also motivates us to persevere to push through, to run the race, and to finish the race. Look in verse 12. I know that if you're looking in the ESV, this is a new paragraph, but I really think it goes best with verses 9 through 11 because I think it brings out why the lowly brother can boast, and it brings out something about his exaltation, and it incentivizes him to keep rejoicing. Verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, He will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. When you take verses 9 through 11 and you contrast it with verse 12, it becomes clear what really matters. What really matters is not your earthly status. It's eternal life. What really matters is not whether you are rich or poor, lowly or exalted in worldly measures. Rather, the one who is truly blessed, real blessing, the blessing that matters, that is to receive the crown of life that God promises to those who love him. Now, this crown that James refers to, he's not just talking about headgear. This isn't like, you know, the little princess tiara that my girls like to wear when they play dress up. That's not the crown of life. James is talking about receiving from God the reward and the honor and the prize of eternal life. 
The crown of life is life, life that is eternal. This crown will not wither in the sun. This crown will not pass away like the flower when the seasons change. This is a treasure that cannot be taken away, even by physical death. This is a lasting status symbol, greater than any earthly position or possession. And James says, if you receive that, that is a real blessing. That is the blessing that matters. That's the blessing we ought to not only rejoice in, but reach for in faith. This is the reward we seek, the gift we desire, the treasure that we leave everything else behind for. Jesus says that it's of no profit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul. Eternal life is what matters. That is true blessing. And this verse offers us encouragement. There is a future reward, but it also offers us an exhortation, doesn't it? He's calling us to persevere. If blessing, if the blessing of the crown is for those who endure to the, to the end, those who display what, what theologians call the perseverance of the saints, Proof that we are chosen by God. Proof that we have believed in his son. Proof that our heart has been made new. If that is really us, then we will endure to the end. And there is a call here to persevere and to endure. And this perseverance is shown not to be a matter of simply gritting your teeth, willing yourself forward. This perseverance, James tells us, is a matter of loving God. Look at it, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. James says those who stand the test, those who remain steadfast, are those who love God. They're synonymous. If you are a Christian then you are one who is marked by the love of God. You love him, not perfectly, but truly. Not perfectly, but faithfully. Not perfectly in every moment, but consistently until the day you reach the finish line. Whether your heart stops and your brain starts firing or whether Jesus comes back, whatever it may be, The one who endures to the end will receive something that has been promised to those who love God. So there's no such thing as someone who loves God but doesn't persevere to the end. And there's no such thing as someone who perseveres to the end who doesn't love God. It is one and the same. What you pursue ultimately reveals what you love. If you love the things of this world, that's what you'll pursue. If you love God, you will endure with steadfastness, the trials that come. You will persevere in your faith all the way to the end, and you will receive the crown of life. Those who love God are those who know him, those who have trusted in the good news of the gospel and had their hearts made new. We love him because he loved us, and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So if you have faith in this future grace, if you believe in the promise, and if you love God and desire this blessing to receive this crown of eternal life, then that will be evidenced by the fact that you remain steadfast under trial. Verse 12 says, forget wealth, forget earthly status, forget those things. Go for the crown of eternal life. That is real blessing. That's what we should be looking to and reaching for and waiting to receive. Friend, if you are a Christian here today, If you are one who truly loves God and knows him in the saving sense, then you have the hope of eternal life guaranteed to you. You have a promise of grace that is to come, a future experience of grace when you reach the finish line. So friends, why is it that you and I still act sometimes as if earthly blessings and our earthly status is so important? Because you you may know these things and believe these things like me, but the reality is there's temptation, isn't there? To care about my money too much. To care about what other people think about me too much. I don't want to be a lowly brother. 
Yeah, the rich man's going to lose everything, but I still would rather you know, lose everything than not have had it in the first place. And there's a pull there. There's a pull. It's not that working hard or advancing in life is wrong. But friends, here's the danger. What's wrong is when our hearts become directed toward that. And instead of loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind and strength, we are loving the world. That is a danger, a danger to avoid. That's not the expression of faith. Genuine faith, real faith, saving faith is not going to be displayed by a love for the world and a pursuit of those things. So friends, if your heart has become consumed with those things, if your joy has become tethered to your job or your bank account or your social standing, your reputation among others, then friends, you need to repent and redirect your faith to God, redirect your love to Jesus Christ. Ask yourself this question today. How much of your heart, how much of your strength is given to pursuing earthly things that you think are going to bring you joy and blessing? Friends, when our perspective is off and we're living that way, then we aren't looking in faith to future grace. We've lost perspective. And we won't be able to boast in our exaltation if we experience being lowly. We won't, be, we won't be able to boast in our humiliation when we watch our earthly riches and status crumble before our eyes. What this reveals is that our faith in the promise of God is weak. And we need to have our perspective corrected. Jesus says in Matthew 6, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. And then Jesus says this profound statement, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our heart needs to be oriented towards heaven. Our treasure needs to be the eternal inheritance and the kingdom that is coming. And to seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and trust that God will take care of the rest. All those other things will be added to us if we really need them. So friends, rather than focusing this week on preserving your worldly position or on improving your worldly standing in a financial sense, James urges us instead to focus on running the race, to focus on enduring trials and persevering to the end. If we are ever going to enjoy that reward and receive the crown and cash in, as it were, on the investments we've made, laying up those treasures in heaven, then we have to get there, don't we? we got to stay in the race and stay on target and keep our eyes fixed on Christ and guard against allowing our flesh to become enamored with the things of this world. This is a matter of faith in Christ. Genuine faith is proven to be genuine by persevering and looking to the end. Friends, please understand that James is not just playing the part of motivational speaker here. Not just telling you, you can do it, don't worry about that. His exhortation to persevere is a serious matter. And it's a serious matter because eternal life is at stake. Do you remember the parable of the farmer and the seed? Jesus tells this story in Luke chapter 8. This farmer goes out to plant. And he reaches in his bag, he grabs a handful of seed, and he's throwing it out. And Jesus said, some seeds fall on the path where everybody cuts through the field every day and the soil is so hard that it can't germinate. The birds come and, and eat, eat that seed. He said other seed falls on ground that has shallow soil because there's a lot of rock and, and stones that are in that soil. And it springs up at first. It seems to look good. There's other soil that has thorns and weeds and some, some of the seed lands there and it springs up too at first. But Jesus explains that after an amount of time, the rocky soil, it can't sustain life. When the sun comes out, the plants that grow up there wither, and they don't bear fruit. And the, the plants that spring up in the thorny and weedy soil, they get choked out. Jesus says, as he explains this parable to his disciples, he says, you know what, what the stony soil and the thorns represent? When trials come, that's like the sun beating down. If you have no roots, you fall away. 
And, and the thorny soil is all the cares and the distractions of the world. James is talking about both of those things here. We need to endure in times of testing and trial. And we need to not be distracted and, and, and taken away by all the cares of the world. We need genuine faith to persevere through those things so that we are like the good soil, the soil where the seed sprouts up and the roots go deep. When the sun goes out, comes out, it survives. And it's not choked out by the thorns and the weeds. Instead, it bears much fruit. I want you to consider today that it's possible for some of you in here to have signs of life, to, to even be excited about the things of God, to want to believe all these things and to be trying to be a good person. But if there are no roots that go deep, if you don't have genuine, authentic faith, you're going to fall away. And eternal life is at stake. 1 Corinthians 15.1, Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You see, genuine saving faith is faith that perseveres to the end. Faith that gives up and falls away and walks away is not genuine faith and will not receive the crown of life because it means you're not truly born again. Colossians 1.21 says, You once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, but he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Those who fall away and do not remain steadfast in their faith reveal that their hearts do not truly love God and their faith is not genuine. No love for God is evidence you've not been born of God. Love for God is descriptive of those who stand, those who are his, those who have been born again, and those who will receive the crown of eternal life. So perhaps I'm speaking to some of you here today who do not have this kind of faith, this kind of love for God. You do not have a heart-consuming love for Him. Instead, you actually love the world. You love the things of the world. You love the things that the world has to offer. You love the way the world operates and the values of the world. Ultimately, you love yourself. And you're here because maybe you're a little bit interested, or maybe your parents made you come, not sure which, um, maybe you're like the seed that seems to be springing up at first but is in danger of falling away. If that describes you, then please hear loud and clear the wisdom and the warning that James offers you today that one day everything you could possibly gain in this world is going to be lost. It'll be gone. What other people think of you on that day will be totally irrelevant. What you even think about yourself in that day will be totally irrelevant. What God the judge thinks of you on that day will be a matter of eternal life or eternal judgment. As you stand there empty-handed, naked and exposed, as it were, before the holy and righteous judge of all the earth, will he find genuine faith in you? Will he find true love for God in you? Don't leave here today thinking, that what matters is how far you can get in this world. Friends, life is short and you will die. So let me ask you, do you believe in the good news of the gospel? Do you belong to the family of God? Are your sins forgiven through faith in Christ? If not, if you've been loving for the world and living for the world, then turn today from those empty things and place your faith in Christ. Receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. Bow the knee to him. Let go of all those other things that are doomed to fade away and receive eternal life through the grace of God in his son, Jesus Christ. Believe in the gospel and entrust yourself to his mercy. And then join us in running the race and enduring trials and looking with joy and with faith to the crown of life that is coming.
If you're a Christian here today, let me ask you, is your joy perhaps tethered to earthly things, to your financial status, your social status? Do you think that if you could only improve your situation, maybe get a better job or move into a nicer place, or if you could only make connections with the right people, that then you would be happy? Do you think that maybe if only people would notice you and appreciate you or understand you or value you, that then you could be happy, then you could be content? Is that how you're thinking today? Or or let me flip it around and ask it this way. How do you respond when you lose? When the stability and the freedom and the safety of earthly resources are suddenly threatened or maybe lost? How do you respond when that job evaporates or when people turn against you, when your reputation is wrongly damaged, or maybe when you get overlooked, passed over, neglected, ignored, forgotten? Does that rob you of your joy? Our joy must be tethered to the grace that is to come, believing in God's promises, looking to the reward. We ought to be those kind of people that by God's grace and through eyes of faith can deal with lack and can deal with loss. We can deal with being lowly because our heart is full, full of the grace of God, joy in him and faith that he is going to bring us safely home and bring us into his kingdom and bestow upon us an eternal inheritance with Christ. We need that perspective. We need to be looking to what comes next. And rejoice in that so that we can smile when the things of this world slip through our fingers, so that we can rejoice in our humiliation because we know that what we have in Christ can never be lost. Brother, sister, don't let earthly status control your joy. Don't be enamored with wealth. It's so seductive. Let me encourage you to pour all your effort and energy into looking to Christ and enduring in your faith, to trusting his promise of future grace. And let the joy of Christ energize you to keep running the race, to endure and persevere. The bottom line here that James shows us is that there's two ways to look at life. You can choose to let the world's measurement of blessing and status and value define you, Or you can look to God's eternal reward as the true definition of privilege and his judgment as the true definition of tragedy and loss. And you can allow that evaluation to cause you to rejoice now and to encourage you and strengthen you as you seek to stand the test. Let's pray for God to strengthen our faith in future grace and produce in us joyful perseverance no matter what we face in life. Bow your heads and let's pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. The grace that has set your love upon us and chosen us to be your children. Made us children in your family, brothers and sisters with one another. We thank you, God, for the grace of forgiveness. And the gracious promise that we will receive the crown of life. An eternal reward, an inheritance with Christ when your kingdom comes in its fullness. God, that's a gift. We don't earn that by our perseverance. We don't earn that by our efforts. That's a gift. It's grace. We're thankful for it. Lord, we're even thankful for the faith to believe that promise. That's a gift. But God, we are sobered this morning to realize how easy it is for us to not look at our life through eyes of faith but to start using the world's measuring stick for blessing. And Lord, we confess that sometimes our joy is fragile and bitter, brittle, because we lose perspective. Lord, we thank you for your word and how it corrects our vision. I pray that today that our minds would be renewed and transformed, that we would not be conformed to the way the world thinks, the way the world measures things. I pray that you would protect us from the seductive power of wealth and earthly status, the pride of life. I pray that you would keep our eyes fixed on Christ. Give us this right perspective. Strengthen our faith so that we endure with joy to the end. 
Lord, for any among us today who do not have this saving, genuine faith, I pray that today they would hear the call of Christ, that they would recognize their sinfulness and their need for a Savior. And I pray that today they would turn away from all the empty promises of the world and instead receive Christ. Amen.